So I'm Francisco Castro. I am a PhD student at Columbia Business School. And I'm going to talk to you about my work on the scope of sequential screening with exposed participation constraints. This is joint work with uh, Dirk Bergman and Gabriel Bantrop. The main motivation we have for this project is our exposed IR selling mechanism uh, that are observing practice. And we have two main examples in mind. One is online shopping. And we can think of online shopping uh, happening sequentially. So first, a buyer goes online, buys an item. Then that item is delivered to the buyer. The buyer gets a chance to inspect the object. And after inspection, that buyer can uh, return the object or keep the object. In, in the case that the buyer decides to send the object back, uh, he can get a full refund. So after this whole selling process, we see that because of the full refund, the buyer has a non-negative net utility, thus the exposed IR. The second example that we have in mind uh, is related to the online display advertising industry. Specifically, we're thinking about waterfall auctions. And the way they, they work is they work sequentially. And basically, buyers in this auction, they choose among different second price auctions. And these different second price auctions have different, different reserve prices, which are decreasing. And also, they have different priorities, which are also decreasing. So when an item arrives to this auction, um, the auctioneer first tries to sell this item through the highest priority auction with a high reserve. And if, if he fails to sell the object through this first auction, he tries a second auction, which uh, has the second highest priority and the second highest reserve. Um, and after the buyer choose uh, these, these auctions, the, the, the auction that they will be participating in, they basically start bidding. So we see again here that after this whole selling process, uh, the buyers at the end, uh, they, don't, they are not charged an upfront fee, and they participate in a second price auction. So they have, at the end, a non-negative net utility, again relating to this exposed IR. And we make two, three fundamental observations about these mechanisms. First is that they work sequentially. The second one is that there is a room for the screening. So for example, in our waterfall auction story, we have that the, the buyers have to decide uh, among different auctions with ha which had different priorities and reserve. So they were screened. And the third, the third observation is that there seems to be this sort of business constraint that relates to exposed IR. Uh, and in the case of online shopping, it gave the, to the buyer the ability to withdraw the relationship. And in, ca in the case of the waterfall auctions, we didn't have upfront fees, and we were using uh, second price auctions. So combining these three fundamental observations, a natural question to ask is, what is the structure of the optimal selling mechanism that takes into account this, uh, these three fundamental observations? And the most natural framework to address this question is sequential screening with exposed participation constraints. So let me give you a model. Uh, the primitives are as follows. We have one seller selling a single item to one buyer. This buyer uh, is going to have a type denoted by K, which can be either low or high. Uh, and, the, and the buyer uh, is uh, of type low with probability alpha L and of type uh, high with probability alpha H. Also, the buyer is going to have a valuation for the item, uh, theta, distributed according to some distribution, fk, depending on the type. And both the type and the valuation will be private information for the buyer. We, were, we will be assuming that the distribution fk is, FK is regular, and also that the parties are risk neutral, and all these primitives uh, are going to be common knowledge. Uh, given the primitives, we can go to the uh, terms of trade. And basically, because of the relation principle, we can focus on incentive compatible direct relation mechanisms. So for example, if a, if a buyer has, is of type K and has valuation theta, the buyer is going to be allocated the object according to some allocation rule XK of theta, and will have to pay to the seller uh, a transfer TK of theta. 
Then when the buyer uh, is truthful, his uh, net utility is going to be given by uk of theta equal to the valuation theta times the allocation xk of theta minus the transfer tk of theta. So given the, the primitives, now we can think of the timeline, timeline that we have in mind. So we think of two periods, period one and period two. At the beginning of the first period, the buyer privately learns her type, low or high. Then this, this basically this type tells the buyer uh, what is the distribution that, he, uh, that she has. And then the seller is gonna offer uh, the contract, which is gonna be the allocation rule and the transfer. And then the buyer is gonna reveal her type to the mechanism. At the beginning of the second period, the buyer privately learns her type, uh, her valuation theta, and, and reveals it to the mechanism. After this, uh, the terms of the contract realize, and the buyer gets uh, uh, her net utility given by theta times allocation uh, minus the transfer, and the buyer and the seller, sorry, gets the transfer TK of theta. And the constraint that we are adding here is that whenever the net utility that the buyer gets from this, uh, this contract is negative, then the, the buyer has the option uh, to withdraw the relationship. And this is the ex post IR constraint. So now given that we have um, the primitives and the timeline, we can think of, this, of what is the problem that the seller wants to solve. And basically the seller wants to find the optimal allocation and transfer that maximizes the expected payment that, she received, that he received from the, from the contract. Uh, subject to three constraints. The first set of constraints are the ex post, um, sorry, ex ante uh, incentive compatibility constraint. Basically, this says that the, the buyer has to reveal her type truthfully. Then we have the ex post incentive compatibility constraint that say that the buyer has to reveal her valuation truthfully. And finally, the constraint we are adding here is that is the ex post uh, in, individual rationality constraint which says that for every type K and for every evaluation theta, the buyer has to have a non-negative uh, net utility. And by the envelope theorem, uh, we can solve this problem and it's enough to, to find uh, an allocation rule that is non-decreasing and also solve for the, lowest, uh, the utility of the lowest exposed type UK uh, uh, of zero. So there are two possible solutions that can emerge uh, in this problem. The first one is a, a solution that we call static. A static solution basically does not differentiate uh, between types. So basically uh, the allocation rule and the transfer will not depend on the type and, and a buyer will get the same allocation and transfer regardless of her type. This solution uh, does not screen the buyer and um, and what this means is that we, to solve for the optimal mechanism in this case uh, is equivalent to solve for the optimal Meyerson mechanism in which the distribution is, is just a mixture distribution of the types. And one can show that in this case, since we have only one buyer, the optimal mechanism is a posted price mechanism, which we denote by PS. The second contract uh, it's a dynamic contract, and this is basically uh, the opposite of the static. Uh, it's a contract that screens the types. So, for example, if you have a low, if we have a low and high type buyers, we will have uh, different allocations for each type. And if it's more familiar for you, you can think of the static contract as a pooling contract, and, for, um, and you can think about the dynamic as a separating contract. Before, before I give uh, our main results, let me talk a, a little about the related literature. And so there are two main areas that, they, that relate to our work. On one side, we have the revenue management area. Uh, and here there is a very nice work uh, from some, of, some people that are in the audience that work on dynamic uh, mechanism design with exposed IR. Uh, but the work that is more related to ours is the paper by, by Celis et al. Uh, which proposes um, a specific auction called the Vintac auction. And, and the main feature of this auction basically is that the low type valuation buyers are randomized. And as I will show you three slides from now, uh, our optimal mechanism 
will, will share the same feature. A main difference of our work with, uh, with this set of, of papers is that uh, we focus on sequential mechanism and we add the term screen here. Uh, on, the, on, the other, on the other side, our work relates to the economics literature, specifically to, to the classical work of Curti and Lee and Eson Santes. And the main difference here is that um, these papers, they, do not, uh, they don't do expose IR. But the paper that is, is the closest to ours is, is a re review of economic studies paper but by Kramer and, and Strauss in 2015. And they basically study the same problem that we study. Uh, but the result is that is only, uh, they're only able to provide a sufficient condition for the optimality of the static contract. Uh, whereas what we do is to focus on a, on a more large set of questions. Uh, specifically, we want to know when is a static contract optimal and when is not. And as I just mentioned, Kramer and Strauss have a partial answer to this question. They give a sufficient condition. And this condition is basically a very strong assumption about the, um, the a very strong distributional assumption uh, about the primitives. Uh, but what we do is we drop this assumption and we find necessary and sufficient conditions for our general framework for the optimality of the static contract. A second question that we ask then is, OK, when the static contract is not optimal, what happened? What does the optimal mechanism look like? And, and we are able to come up with a full characterization of the optimal contract. So now, let me show you uh, specifically what are, what are our results. And I'm going to do this in terms of the exponential valuation, just because uh, in this case, we have very nice characterizations. And, and also, the results have very, very, very good intuition. But I want to stress here that we have general results uh, for general distributions that are available in, in our paper online. So we have exponential distributions. Um, uh, the parameter is going to be lambda k. Uh, so the high type buyer uh, is going to have a high mean given by 1 over lambda h, and the low type buyer is going to have a low mean given, given by 1 over lambda l. And, and here we ask, is the static contract always optimal? Remember, the static contract is this pooling contract. And the answer is no. It's not always. And, and we have a chart characterization for this that says that the static contract is optimal if and only if this inequality over here is satisfied. And this inequality is very nice because the intuition behind it is that whenever the high type buyer and the low type buyer are very similar, meaning that the parameters are very, are very close to each other, then this ratio on the right hand side is going to be large, and therefore this inequality is going to be satisfied. And, and by this proposition, the static contract is going to be optimal. This means that whenever the types are very similar, not surprisingly, we want to uh, offer a contract that pulls the types. On the other hand, when the types are very different, meaning that these parameters are very far away from each other, this ratio is going to go down, and this inequality is not going to be satisfied. And therefore, we will want to separate or screen uh, the types. And so in this case, we can come up with the optimal dynamic contract. And basically, we have this proposition that says, if the static contract is not optimal, then the allocations are as follows. We have an allocation for the low type, an allocation for the high type. For the low type, we only allocate the object whenever her valuation is above a threshold theta L, and with some probability strictly lower than one chi. And, when, uh, and, and, and for the high type buyer, we allocate the object whenever her valuation is above some threshold theta h and with certainty. And, and here I want, to, I want you to notice this, that basically the thresholds are ordered as follows. The mean of the low type uh, is below the threshold for the low type, which is below the threshold of the high type, which is below the, the mean of the high type. And basically, given this, we can, we can give some interesting observations about this contract. The first one is that the low type buyer is allocated the object um, more frequently 
because her threshold is below the threshold of the high type. And this is to prevent the low type buyer from taking the, the contract of the high type. The other observation is that the low type buyer is randomized, and this is to prevent the high type to take the contract from the low type. And finally, if we compare this dynamic cont optimal contract to the contract uh, with public types, um, which is given basically by, by a threshold allocation, okay? So in the public type contract, we allocate the object to the types to the buyer whenever her valuation is above the mean. We can see two distortions. One is that the low type buyer is worse off in two dimensions, uh, meaning that the low type buyer is allocated uh, the object uh, less often and with less probability. And the second distortion is that the high type buyer is better off because he's allocated the object uh, more often and with certainty. And before I conclude, let me show you uh, this slide that basically says that screening matters. In what sense? In, in the sense of, of, of the revenue, because so here I'm plotting on the, on the horizontal axis the difference between the types. So the farther, the farther we move on the horizontal axis, axis, the more different are the types. And on the vertical axis, I'm, I'm plotting the revenue improvement, the percentage of revenue improvement of this dynamic contract over the static contract. And basically what this says is that when the types are different, there is a huge uh, possibility improvement that we, can, that we can do when we use the dynamic contract instead of the static contract. And this is, all of this is, is to say that there is a non-trivial uh, improvement that we can obtain when using a, a dynamic contract. And, and just uh, a few concluding words um, about our future, our future work and, and work in progress is that first, in this project we have focused on two types. And, and, but we want to extend this to more types, and we already have a necessary and sufficient condition for the optimality of the static contract for an arbitrary number of exante types, and we are working on, on finding the optimal dynamic contract for an arbitrary, arbitrary number of exante types. And then what we want to do in the future is to, to go to the auction setting and, and try to think of, of concrete applications of, the, of this optimal uh, dynamic uh, mechanism design problem. And this is all I have. Thank you.